Uh, thank, you. thank you, Marisa. Um, so uh, let's get started. Uh, a little bit about me. Um, my name is Avi. I was the original maintainer of the Linux hypervisor, uh, KVM. Uh, I'm the co-maintainer of uh, CSTAR, which is an IO and asynchronous programming framework, and of uh, CDDB, which is uh, a database, a big data database that is capable of uh, managing multiple terabytes or petabytes of data, and also co-founder of um, the company. So in both roles, um, with Linux KVM and uh, CDDB, or I've had to deal with uh, a lot of uh, IO also on previous roles. Um, and I'd like to share some of my experiences uh, on that topic. So a little bit about uh, StellarDB. Uh, so it is a distributed NoSQL database uh, that is for applications that have large amounts of data from terabytes to petabytes uh, for applications that need uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of uh, operations per second, all at uh, low latency. Um, there are a lot of users and uh, the users were able to report uh, both the reduction in, in latency, especially in the 99th percentile, uh, and also an improvement in throughput and a reduction in the number of nodes, uh, which translates directly to a cost reduction. Um, it comes with an open source enterprise and cloud editions, and it has a compatibility with Apache Cassandra protocols and Amazon DynamoDB. Uh, so migrating from an existing database is uh, quite easy and it uh, joins a, a large ecosystem. Um, some of our customers, so if you uh, uh, recognize uh, some of those logos that uh, make up a whole row or column and just shout the uh, bingo and you might win a, a fabulous prize uh, but probably not but uh, uh, you can see that uh, we have customers from all sorts of uh, uh, different kinds of applications um, and what uh, what connects them all that they all need to manage large amount of data and latency is very important to them so of course, uh, for a database, uh, accessing data and accessing data on disk is very important. And uh, Linux offers multiple, multiple ways to access data. Uh, we'll discuss uh, the four broad categories in this presentation, the difference between them and what to choose for your application. So what are those uh, four methods? So there was a traditional uh, system calls, read and write, uh, together with uh, open, close, seek, and, and etc. Those were those come from the 1970s, and that's how most applications are written. Uh, there's the more modern MAP, which uh, is used by some newer applications. Um, there is direct I/O, um, which bypasses the, the, the Linux page cache. Uh, and offers some benefits, but also some complexities. And finally, there is a most modern approach, asynchronous IO, which is also joined today by uh, the fashionable IO Uring, and we'll discuss that uh, last. So in order to evaluate those methods, we'll look at uh, two different workloads as examples. So one example is um, a desktop workload. So it, it's not using a huge amount of data, but still it is data intensive, intensive like Git. So Git deals with um, uh, repositories that can be a gigabyte or more in size. So it's a large working set, but usually it will fit in memory. Uh, Git is a short lived application, it's actually noted for being uh, extremely fast. So an execution of Git can take just a few milliseconds. Um, the synchronization is relaxed. So uh, you, you don't worry too much if uh, um, the data makes it to disk um, because uh, you, usually you trust your uh, desktop or laptop not to crash. And if it does crash, it's not the end of the world. You can usually recover your work. Um, and it's partially threaded. 
So some of the operations uh, run in multiple threads, but most of them run in just a, a single thread. Um, and let's contrast it with a different workload, a database workload. Uh, and for a database, the working set usually exceeds memory. And this is because the database needs to manage many terabytes of data, but you don't want to buy uh, multiple terabytes of RAM. Um, and a database is a long lived application. You start it once and you hope it stays up for months or years. Of course, you have to update it from time to time, but it's, it's an application that uh, uh, doesn't start and uh, shut down all the time. Uh, it usually has a strict synchronization requirements. So when you acknowledge a write, you want to make sure that it hit disk and that the crash or power failure will not cause in loss of data. So you want to guarantee that the data is durable. And a database is usually heavily threaded. So it's running on large multi-core machines and uh, the clients have um, many threads. So there are many users interacting with the database at the same time. So the applications are quite different, although they both uh, access, do a lot of IO. And that will uh, determine the way they, they perform IO. So we'll evaluate the four different methods on different criteria. So the first one, of course, is performance. Uh, but performance, uh, also comes in a, in a second flavor, which is the worst case performance. So, uh, and another way to look at it is predictability. So you don't want just your regular performance to be good, but you may also want uh, your worst case performance to be good, so you don't have surprises. Um, in a desktop workload, it might not matter. So if once in a while things get slow, you wait for a minute, maybe you go have a coffee, uh, but nothing bad happens. But for a database, having uh, a good worst case performance uh, can be very important. So you don't want a surprise. And last is the complexity. So we want to avoid complexity. It's expensive, it's a source of bugs. So it's best to avoid it, but sometimes it cannot be avoided. So let's start with traditional uh, read write. We hope we doesn't need much explanation. So let's look at uh, what happens in the IO path. Um, so in the best case, we, uh, the application issues the read, and if we're lucky, it hits uh, the cache. So everything is pretty sweet. Uh, you perform a system call and the kernel copies the data from the cache. This is like, this gets excellent performance and is exceedingly simple. It gets more complicated if the data does not exist in cache. Um, and uh, what happens then is that, that the kernel tells the disk to start the, the performance a read, and then it looks for other things to do. It cannot re return to the application because this is a synchronous uh, system call. So it needs to find some other thread, maybe in the same application, maybe in a different application to switch to. So it might switch to your browser. Uh, or maybe another database thread. Meanwhile, the other thread performs uh, its own computation and the disk performs the read. Uh, if, if we didn't find another thread to execute, then uh, the CPU will just be put to sleep by the kernel. Uh, the disk will transfer the data to the kernel and then interrupt the kernel. And the kernel will notice that and switch back to the uh, database thread or application thread and, and copy the data. And you can see that there is more complexity involved here. And it's also more expensive because we're hitting a context switch. So if this is a common operation, we will see a lot of context switches and performance will begin to drop. Um, this is fine for something like Git, which expects to hit the cache most of the time. But it's not so good for a database, which expects to have a large share of uh, misses from cache. Uh, let's look at the, the write path. Uh, and again, usually it's uh, quite sweet. Uh, you copy the data, you issue the write system call, and it copies the data to the kernel and returns immediately. And the application can continue processing. So it, the data doesn't hit the disk at all. It remains cached in memory. 
Uh, and the idea here is that uh, uh, the kernel is looking for opportunities to merge multiple write calls or even avoid the write to disk completely if you're writing a temporary file uh, and then delete it. Uh, if you're deleted uh, quickly enough, then you might not need to write the temporary file to disk at all. And so you save on IO. Uh, if you did not delete the file, then eventually the kernel will perform a write back uh, in parallel with application processing. So that's good because it happens in parallel with, with regular processing, uh, but also it means that there is and that's predictability here for a database which needs to guarantee uh, that the data hits the disk. There are ways to ensure that, but I won't go into them now. However, the write can get more complicated. So before, um, the kernel allocated some memory for the write and uh, just put it there. But uh, memory is not infinite unless your uh, aunt owns a, a DRAM factory. So it's very finite and you might run out of memory. And what the kernel will do if it runs out of memory, then it will look for older data that was written earlier uh, and it will start writing this older data. And while it's waiting for this write back to complete and uh, uh, free us some memory, it will switch to uh, another thread similar to what we had in, uh, in the read path in the case of a cache miss. And when the write completes, it will interrupt and uh, signal the, the kernel that uh, it can continue with the write and then the write will uh, continue. And later on, our own write will be written back to this. Um, so you can see that in, usually write is very fast, but in some cases it, it can uh, become more complicated and slower. So let's uh, evaluate uh, traditional read and write. So the performance is usually very good. Um, the predictability, however, is bad because you cannot tell if uh, a read will uh, hit or miss the cache. And you certainly cannot tell if a write will uh, have enough memory or if it will need to uh, slow down in order to wait for um, previous writes to be written back. Uh, so predictability is not so good. But the complexity is low, it's a well under, understood and simple interface and lots of applications are written with it. Um, so let's, uh, let's move on. This is more or less a baseline for, um, for, the, for the talk. So let's talk about MAP. Um, I imagine most people are familiar with it, but I'll, I'll, I'll say a few words about it anyway. Um, so, the application tells the kernel to create uh, a memory mapping for the file, an area of memory that has a one-to-one -one relationship, the relationship with the data on the file. And any reader write to this memory using regular machine instructions will uh, transparently be converted into a reader write to the file. The kernel manages it uh, in the background. Um, and uh, the amount of memory that is assigned to the mapping will also um, uh, be transparently managed. So the kernel can decide to assign a lot of memory to the mapping in order to uh, make it faster at the expense of more memory, or it can assign less memory to the mapping, uh, which will make it slower, uh, but it will allow moving memory to other applications. And usually the kernel is quite good at finding out uh, what to do in this case. And in many cases, you can uh, just ignore the fact that you're doing IO here. You're just treating it as if you're working with memory and the kernel just takes care of everything. So this is pretty nice. So let's look at uh, some IO interactions. The first one are reads that hits cache. Uh, it's even better than what we had before with um, the system call. So here we don't even have a system call. We just read from the memory and continue, and this can take less than a nanosecond. So this is uh, uh, amazingly fast. Um, if we miss, uh, the picture is similar to what we had in the system call where, where we had, um, uh, we, we needed to issue a, a disk read and, and perform to and perform a context switch to a different application. 
or maybe just a different thread. Um, but it's slightly different in that instead of having a system call, we have a, a page fault. It's more or less similar. Uh, and one thing that uh, is an advantage here is that uh, we even avoid the copy. So the memory mapping uh, between the kernel and application is shared. Um, so the, when the disk performs the, the DMA, the direct memory access to kernel memory, it also updates the same memory in the, uh, that's mapped to the application. Uh, so uh, we don't need to perform a data copy and that's a, another win. Uh, and once we return to the application, it will perform the read uh, as if nothing happened. Uh, so a lot of complexity uh, under the hood, but from the application point of view, it's quite simple, although it does reduce the predictability. Um, a write is similarly fast. So a write doesn't involve anything. The application writes to its own memory and doesn't tell anyone. And the kernel uh, will notice in the background that um, the memory was updated and will perform a write, a write back. So again, uh, pretty sweet. Um, there is also a situation where you're doing a write and you don't have, and you're under memory pressure. Uh, but this is uh, uh, quite complicated, so I, I skipped writing a, a slide for that. It's more or less similar to uh, to the case we had for a write with the system calls. So let's look at the evaluation for MAP. So in terms of performance, it's very good, even better than traditional read-write. And in terms of predictability, it's pretty bad. When it works, it works very well. But when, when, as, as the application starts using more and more memory and uh, managing larger amounts of data, it gets less predictable. And you might end up in a situation where the performance is bad. And the complexity is a little bit more complicated. There are some details you have to take care of. Like um, IO is not performed in, in, uh, on page boundaries. And it's, there's more, uh, more things you need to handle. Um, but it's a good trade-off uh, for applications that can utilize it. You're trading off a little bit of complexity for a nice improvement in performance. It's especially good for short-lived applications because they can just uh, uh, re reuse uh, files that are in cache uh, and have very low of startup costs. So applications like Git use MAP and uh, it makes a good match for them. Uh, let's look at the direct IO. So first an explainer, direct IO, the direct part of direct IO means that it bypasses uh, the Linux caching mechanism and goes directly to disk. And that means that the caching must be done by the application itself, unless you don't want caching at all. And immediately that means an increase in complexity. Um, IO transfers are restricted to sectors. So sectors are five aligned 512 byte chunks. And the application is responsible for uh, uh, enlarging accesses. If you want to access just one byte, you need to really access the whole sector. So you need to round it up and down and it adds more complexity. Um, something good is that the transfer bypasses the kernel. So there's no need to copy the data, uh, which improves performance. And there are many additional restrictions. So uh, far too many to, to cover here. So the complexity is quite high. So this is uh, how it looks. Um, there are good news here and bad news. Um, so the good news is that there is just one path. There's actually one slide for both read and write because they look exactly the same. Uh, but the bad news is that uh, in all cases, it's, it's, uh, it's slow. So in all cases now, we don't have a case where we hit cache because we bypass caching. So in all cases, we need to perform a context switch and wait for an interrupt and then switch back. Uh, so the DMA means we don't copy the data, but it also means that there's a huge amount of uh, uh, context switches. 
So let's evaluate it. Um, the performance is bad because of the huge amount of complex switches, uh, but the predictability is good because you know exactly what's going to happen. You, you don't have a case where you run out of memory and the, the performance starts to tank and the complexity is high. So this is certainly not a good match for a desktop application like Git, and also not a very good match for something like a database because of the not so good performance. So that's the direct IO, and it's really uh, just a stepping stone to uh, asynchronous direct IO. So what is asynchronous uh, direct IO? So it's like direct IO, but instead of uh, a single thread managing uh, just one transfer at a time, uh, this single thread can launch multiple transfers. And not only can it launch multiple transfers, it can also continue doing other things while uh, the transfers are happening. Uh, so that's the asynchronous part. Uh, and the kernel will notify his application when an IO transfer completes. Um, so instead of having a synchronous system call, we have asynchronous messaging. The, the uh, application sends a message to the kernel to do something on its behalf, like read and write data from disk, but it doesn't need to wait for the message to be processed. It can continue going on and send more messages if it wants. So the diagram for, uh, for that is really there is no one diagram for it because every interaction looks a little different. So in this case, I, I have uh, an example with uh, three reads and one write. And the application starts by uh, preparing uh, by preparing those reads and writes in memory. And then it instructs the kernel to uh, start performing, performing those requests. And uh, the kernel tells the disk to perform those requests and returns immediately. The disk starts processing and now the disk and, and the application are running in parallel. Eventually, a few of the requests complete and the disk tells the kernel and the kernel uh, tells the application and the application picks up those completions and can start acting on them. And the, the completions can happen out of order. Um, so there is quite a lot of complexity here, but also uh, there is no context switches. Usually there is no context switches because there is always um, the opportunity for the application to continue processing. It never has to wait uh, and it can utilize the CPU as long as it has work to do. So in terms of uh, performance, this is uh, peak performance. Um, so let's uh, evaluate it. The performance here is uh, excellent. Um, the predictability is good because we bypassed the uh, the caching system, uh, we don't have a case where we hit or miss cache. So uh, we, we know, um, we, we know the, uh, the characteristics of the IO, um, but the complexity is high because you need to be able to uh, manage uh, multiple requests in flight. You need to perform the caching on your own. Uh, and that's why for asynchronous IO, usually you have a framework for performing the IO for you, and you don't just uh, do it yourself. Um, so for something like a desktop application, this is a, a huge overkill. And also because you cannot rely on kernel caching, it will actually perform worse. Every time you, you start this desktop application, it will have to read all of the data from scratch. But for something like a database, which uh, uh, lives for uh, weeks or months and uh, uh, is able to manage its own cache, uh, it is really a, an excellent match. So um, let's look at, uh, at, the, at, the, at some conclusions from that. So we have, uh, many ways to uh, uh, to access IO, oh, just four different ways were described here, but there are actually more nuances and 
there are ever more ways to do that. Um, for the large majority of applications, it's better to leverage um, all of the huge efforts that went into Linux to, to optimize it and um, just uh, stand on the shoulder of giants and, uh, and, and reuse all of that work. Uh, but for applications that do have uh, uh, um, stricter requirements, like a very large working set that exceeds memory, uh, if you have requirements about um, uh, data durability, so you want to uh, be sure uh, when the data uh, hits disk uh, and you want to control it on a per request basis, um, then the extra control and the extra efficiency um, can be can give you um, huge benefits. And uh, it takes it takes some investment. So usually you will need uh, an IO framework, uh, and uh, and you will need to understand more how the disk works. So you will need to uh, perform some experiments, but it can be uh, very rewarding for such an application. Um, so let's have a, a table to summarize everything. So with a traditional read and write, uh, if you if the application is not I/O intensive, and I guess that most applications are, are not I/O intensive, or if you're doing uh, simple streaming like uh, uh, like uh, regular pipeline work in Linux, uh, grep and sort, unique, all, all of those uh, uh, core utils that we know and love. The simple uh, read and write are, are, are excellent and they're simple and they perform well and uh, they will work well whether the data is in cache or not. Um, the performance is not stellar, but it's very good. Um, so um, usually that's uh, uh, the go-to method, uh, even though they date back from the 70s. So, for MAP, um, it's excellent when you do have a high, um, uh, when you do have a data intensive application and you do have a lot of random IO. And this is an area where the traditional read write do not excel um, uh, because you need to perform a lot of system calls, which are slow. Um, so, an application like Git, this is. Uh, um, this is where it lives. It needs to do a lot of accesses to um, uh, random accesses to large files, the, the packed files, if people uh, recall. Uh, and you have a, a low disk to RAM ratio. So if you have uh, a data set that is in the order of a few gigabytes, like most Git repositories, most are even smaller than that, um, then it's a really good fit. Uh, uh, the kernel will not be forced to uh, evict pages and maybe make the wrong decision. And usually all of the data that you read will be served from cache. Uh, and you don't really care if uh, the data is written immediately or in a few seconds later. If you're on a the laptop, then it, it's battery backed. And even if not, it's, uh, it's not so terrible uh, if you do have a, a rare power loss. It's not like a database. Um, for direct IO, we saw that uh, although it's uh, very predictable, um, it doesn't really offer a good performance and it does come with a lot of complexity. Uh, so really the only use case is to understand how disks work because direct IO uh, avoids the caching, the, the Linux caching layer uh, you can use it to probe how the disk reacts to, to different cases. And it's simple, so you can uh, easily understand it. So it's a good stepping stone to AIO, but um, not really recommended uh, on its own. And finally, we have uh, direct AIO and uh, direct AIO. And the use case here is uh, databases and uh, really, the similar class of applications uh, like message queues um, and uh, and similar applications. Don't know exactly what, but I'm sure there are plenty of 
uh, IO intensive uh, applications that don't, aren't categorized as databases. Um, so for there, the extra work that goes into uh, using AIO is well worth the effort. Um, it's it's uh, really beneficial to get the predictable performance and low latency. And um, that's what I have. I'd be happy to uh, to take questions now. Abby, there are a couple of questions already in the Q and A that just came through. Okay, um, so I will look. Mm, so okay, so the first question is. Uh, um, Async I operations don't complete in the order that they were triggered. Doesn't this non-determinism impact the correctness of the database? Uh, so certainly the database has to take it into account. Um, and the database has to um, either ensure that the, the order does not matter. So one simple case is uh, reads. So for reads, you usually don't care about the order that they complete. And the other case uh, where the order is important is usually writes. So sometimes the writes, uh, the database can determine that the order does not matter. And it can be if the writes are writing to areas of the file that are unrelated and either order will be fine. Um, and there are cases where the order does matter. And uh, I guess an example is writing to the commit log and then writing to the file. And you want to make sure that you write to the commit log. Um, uh, you, write, you write to the commit log before you start modifying the file. And for that, uh, you can just order it yourself. So you can not issue the second write before you get a completion for the first write. So you're implementing a, a barrier. Um, and usually it's not really a, 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 it's not really complex. There's not really real complexity here. Um, I guess for file systems, it's um, more of an issue. So a file system would want to not update uh, data until the metadata is updated. And sometimes it's the other way around. Uh, so it adds some complexity, but uh, that's life. Um, I have to say that the, the other methods um, don't really solve it because when you do a, if you use write or mapp, then everything appears to you to complete in order, but uh, in in practice, that this can still reorder things and. If you have a power loss event or a crash, then only some of the writes may reach the disk, and they may reach the writes that reach the disk may be the later writes and not the earlier writes. So it's not really um, uh, you, you have to deal with it regardless of the method that you choose, uh, and it can be tricky, uh, but uh, if you're working with databases, then you're used to tricky problems. I hope that uh, answered the question. It is a good question. Um, and if you have more on that, then please uh, ask more. Uh, I have a question. Where where does a storage engine like FoxDB? I guess the question is, where does uh, where does a storage engine like RocksDB fit in here? Um, so I actually don't know what the RocksDB uses. Uh, I hope uh, for their sake that they use asynchronous IO, but they don't really know the code. Um, I know there was, um, um, it was fashionable about 10 years ago to use MAP, but I think that uh, they don't do that. Um, and I don't really know. I know that uh, MongoDB, for example, used MAP and then moved to uh, AIO after a while and they realized uh, it's not the right uh, solution. Mm. And next question. Um, it's a question about the application handling its own caches. Uh, 
Does it mean memory caches and not L1 or L2? Uh, so yes, it's uh, I, I meant using the main memory as a cache for this. And in terms of CPU will cache main memory in the CPU L2 and it will cache the CPU L2 in, in L1. Um, so I was talking about memory caches. Um, and I guess that uh, with persistent memory, you can even add yet another layer. So you can uh, use persistent memory as a cache for disk, and you can use memory as a cache for persistent memory. Uh, there are plenty of uh, topologies that you can choose from. Um, so another question. Uh, how do you deal with the lack of caching here with direct IO at Scylla DB? Um, okay, so it's, it's an interesting question because uh, there are actually multiple answers. Um, so uh, one, one way to, uh, to perform caching is a page cache, uh, which means that the, every block on disk has a block of memory associated with it, which is just a copy of, uh, of, of that block. And we do use that for uh, some of the data, uh, but we also use uh, object caches. And object caches are different uh, in that they're not like a memory image of the block on disk. Instead, they're a subset of the block on disk and they may be, uh, they may uh, be parsed. So uh, some computation, some parsing already took place and we are caching a parsed object. Uh, and this means that we are saving the parsing. Um, and instead of uh, doing the parsing again and again, each time we access this block, even though it's cached, uh, we, we parse it just once and then we uh, reuse the, the parsed object. So we are saving some computation. And on top of that, we. Um, sometimes the, the source for a logical record, um, so you can think of a database row, it can come from multiple files. Uh, and in order to generate a row, you need to merge data from multiple files. So in, instead of caching each individual file separately, uh, we cache uh, the merged result. And so we don't need to perform this merging uh, each time we access the row, instead we perform the merging when we access um, the row the first time, and in subsequent accesses we just uh, uh, access it directly from memory, and this saves this the merging work. Uh, so it's a quite complicated cache, but also can be very efficient when you do need to perform this merging, and this merging is common when you have a log structure the merge tree, which is the uh, storage model that we use, also RoxDB, it's, be and it's becoming more and more popular these days when the data for a particular row comes from multiple uh, uh, files. So I hope that uh, answered the question. And we use all of the methods that I described concurrently in, in a single cache. Um, Uh, so yet another question, and I have to say I expected the question about the IO Uring because it, uh, it's so popular. Uh, do you use IO Uring for asynchronous IO and can you talk more about IO Uring? So uh, right now uh, we use uh, Linux AIO, which is an older interface for asynchronous IO and not IO Uring. And this is simply because we started development uh, long before IO Uring existed. Um, in terms of, uh, the, and we are developing an IO Uring interface for, for CSTAR. Um, in terms of performance, uh, we don't expect it to materially change the performance because um, uh, asynchronous direct IO is about bypassing the kernel. So the kernel doesn't have to do a lot of work. Uh, still, IO Uring uh, has many benefits. Uh, one of them is simply that it's under active development and, and heavy development and it's very well maintained. So it's always better to uh, be, be on a project where things are active and uh, new features and 
uh, optimizations are performed. Um, a second advantage is that it has better ergonomics. Um, so you, you can uh, run uh, IRE ring with uh, caching disabled, but you can also uh, run it with the kernel caching enabled. And this is nicer for testing when you're developing. Uh, you don't want to perform direct IO, you're happy with accessing the page cache because when you're testing, uh, the database is actually like a short live application that doesn't use a large working set. So it's more like Git and less like a, a database. And you're happy to use the page cache in, in that case. Um, and also it has very good integration with networking. And of course, uh, a database does a lot of networking and a lot of uh, um, disk IO. I didn't talk about networking at all. But the fact that IO Ring has integrated networking and, uh, and disk IO uh, uh, means that the, um, the, the management of IO becomes uh, even better. So we have IO Ring under development, and I'm looking forward uh, to switching to it. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty sweet uh, interface. In terms of the patterns that I displayed before in, in the charts, it's really uh, the same as, uh, as AIO. Uh, it's just a, a more pleasant interface and uh, with some optimizations in terms of uh, CPU consumption. Um, Okay, moving on to uh, the next questions. Uh, so, MMAP saves CPU cycle compared to user space cache. Bits are handled by the MMU, which has zero CPU cost. Uh, systems such as LMDB and experimental parallax use dual IO path MMAP and direct IO for writes. Why do you propose that MMAP should only be used for small data sets? So the, the problem with uh, a large, so first, of course, uh, MMAP is used for LMDB and, and very successfully, uh, but when the, the data set becomes large, then uh, the kernel has to continuously uh, unmap pages from, um, uh, uh, from the mapping of, of the file and uh, remap them to new pages. And, First, the kernel has no good knowledge uh, about uh, which page to choose. So it might choose the wrong page. Um, of course, uh, there's a lot of work that went into the kernel into making the LRU algorithm perform well. Uh, but still, it's a, uh, it's a general purpose system and the database is a special purpose system. So it has more knowledge about its own algorithms and it, it, its own patterns. And second, when you uh, remove a page from MAP, then uh, suddenly you move, if uh, maybe I can move to the, to the chart. Um, so suddenly you move from uh, um, the good path which is like you said, extremely, extremely fast and extremely efficient. You move to the, the chart where you have to perform a context switch to another thread. And that means you have to, uh, you have to find another thread. There, there, there might not be another thread. So um, uh, the application suddenly has to provide uh, a large number of threads for the kernel to choose from and it becomes more complicated. With the uh, um, asynchronous IO, um, you, can, uh, you can have uh, a small number of threads that match the number of cores that you have, and uh, uh, that reduces the number of context switches. So as long as the MMAP uh, is able to satisfy the vast majority of uh, reads from, uh, from memory, it, it will perform excellently. But as soon as the uh, MAP uh, uh, starts serving a large number of misses, the performance uh, degrades. Um, so it depends on, um, um, on the size of the data set uh, or rather the working set. The amount of data can be larger than memory, but if the working set 
fits into memory, then it's excellent. But if the working set becomes larger than memory, then the performance uh, starts to degrade. Um, okay, um, next question. Uh, you mentioned C star. Can you please shed more light on what is C star? Um, okay, so C star is a framework for uh, asynchronous uh, networking, uh, CPU, and um, and this IO, and uh, um, asynchronous networking is something that uh, there, there have been many uh, frameworks for doing. So everyone is doing uh, asynchronous networking. No one is doing uh, a blocking networking anymore, for servers at least. Uh, but uh, IO is usually done in a synchronous way, either using MAP or using uh, traditional read and write. And multi-core communications, multi-core uh, utilization is also done in a synchronous way. So usually if you have a, uh, an application that is multi-threaded, um, you have locks to manage uh, uh, shared memory structures. And C-STARS treats everything asynchronously. So it treats uh, disk asynchronously, which is the topic of, uh, of, this, uh, of this talk. Uh, it treats networking asynchronously, and it also treats um, multi-core systems as, uh, by using messaging. So instead of taking a lock and blocking everything until the lock is uh, acquired, instead uh, you send an asynchronous message to a different core. That core performs the access on your behalf, and then it uh, returns. And uh, this uh, uniform way of uh, uh, treating CPU, uh, disk, and networking in in, a, in the same way, all asynchronously, uh, can lead to very highly concurrent applications uh, with no um, with no concurrency bottlenecks. So you never have a lock contention. Uh, it's also more complicated, but it's excellent for highly concurrent applications like databases. Um, so I hope that uh, answers the question. Um, uh, and by the way, Sister is uh, an open source uh, under the Apache license, and you can see it under our uh, GitHub page. Um, so next question, is the SSD garbage collection observable in SILADB benchmarks? Uh, could Integrating such hardware mechanism with the database make it faster or more predictable. Uh, so that's a that's a good and, and complicated question. So the answer here is uh, it depends. Uh, so with newer disks, uh, SSD garbage collection is is less observable, and also uh, CLDB, uh tries to. Uh, take a lot of care in laying out the data in a way that it's friendly to SSD. So we use append only instead of the overwrite. Uh, we recently enabled the online discard, which is uh, a, a file system mechanism to notify the SSD that a particular file has been deleted and no longer in use, and so it can perform the garbage collection algorithms earlier rather than later. Uh, we saw in some disks, especially if uh, those disks were in use for a long time, uh, we did see like significant degradation in, uh, in performance and uh, higher latency. Um, but uh, usually with more, more modern disks, um, it's, it's not visible. Um, uh, there was, there is a lot of talk about uh, uh, something called an open channel SSD, uh, which is uh, an SSD that exposes the garbage collection mechanism. But the fact is that uh, they are not uh, widely usable and um, widely available, and they're hard to use. So we we are not uh, we don't have this interaction. It's definitely very interesting, um, but before such uh, hardware becomes widely available. Uh, probably we can't uh, do uh, anything with it. Certainly, it would make things more predictable, 
Although I feel that with modern file systems, you know, we use the XFS, by the way, and the way that we lay out data on this, I think that the problem is uh, under control. Uh, but certainly it's something to uh, keep in mind if you're uh, developing your own uh, IO engine. Um, so the next question, async IO is also provided by kernel via system calls. Um, so yes, so asynchronous IO is provided by, by system calls. Um, the older methods, the next IO is the system calls are called IO submit and IO get events. And with IO ring, it's, there's one system call called IO during enter. Um, and so although it's using system calls, uh, it's there's a lot of batching involved. So a single system call can submit uh, dozens of IO requests, and they can be disk IO and also um, networking IO. So the cost of the system call is amortized over many operations, and it becomes uh, negligible. Um, there are also mechanisms to bypass a system call uh, under certain conditions. Um, so yes, uh, it's done using system calls, but the cost of the system calls is mitigated. Um, all right, I see uh, there are no more questions. If someone wants me to elaborate on the previous question or, um, or ask a new question, um, I think we have a, a little bit more time. By the way, on our uh, GitHub, you can see um, the CSTAR and CLDB repositories, and you're also welcome to join our Slack channel and ask questions there. There's a dedicated uh, channel for CSTAR uh, and a general channel for uh, CLDB users. So it's both for developers and users of uh, CSTAR and CLDB. Avi, there's another question that came through in the Q&A. Okay, let me look at it. Um, was SPDK considered for uh, CLDB? Um, so yes, um, uh, so SPDK is, uh, um, it's like the counterpart of DPDK, maybe it's a storage plane development kit, I'm not sure about the acronym. And it's a kernel bypass for storage. Um, we did consider it and we even did a bit of a file system work. But in the end, uh, the, uh, the performance and reliability that are provided by, um, uh, by XFS is, uh, uh, is not something that we would want to give up uh, uh, easily. And, the amount of effort that uh, one needs to invest to uh, to, to, to do um, direct uh, IO via SPDK is just too high. So I think there is a marginal improvement there, but it was not worth the, the effort for us. Um, the kernel overhead with the IO Uring and Linux AO is really pretty minimal. So although you're doing uh, system calls, um, the cost of those system calls is amortized. So if a system call takes a, a millisecond or a microsecond or so, maybe two microseconds, if you amortize them over 10 or 20 IOs, then it becomes negligible. Uh, so we considered it, but uh, uh, the, the cost performance trade-off was not beneficial for us. Um, okay, it's another question. Um, so are there non-database applications using CSTAR? Uh, so yes, um, Ceph, which is a distributed file system uh, by Red Hat and others, 
also uh, distributed object storage is migrating to, to CSTAR. Uh, and also um, Red Panda, which is a Kafka compatible message queue is also using CSTAR. It's built on CSTAR from scratch. Um, and there are a few more others. Uh, I guess uh, both a, a file system like Ceph and a message queue like, um, uh, like uh, Red Panda, uh, they're similar to databases in that they're very data intensive. Uh, and, uh, and so it's a similar class of applications, but uh, they are non-database. Non it is, uh, uh, CSTAR really is a good fit for file system and database type applications and um, uh, anything that needs to manage a large amount of data, but uh, outside of this uh, scope, um, it's, it's really a, a lot of complexity. So choose it if, you, if you're performing, a, if you want to perform gigabytes per second of IO at uh, low CPU cost. Okay, I guess we're run out of time. Uh, I hope uh, no questions remain unanswered, but if there were, I'm, I'm happy to uh, answer them on our Slack channel or the mailing list. Uh, so see you there. Thanks everyone and bye-bye. Uh, thank you so much, Avi, for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us and for participating with such great questions. Just a quick reminder that this recording will be up on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. So thank you again, and we hope you will join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.